Welcome back, my lovely tribe. In case y'all can't see, I have my freaking Freddy shirt on today. I don't know if y'all just heard me or not. I have my Freddy Krueger shirt on today, which, by the way, me and Amy from Amy's Crypt, we got the same shirt. I feel semi-famous just for having the same shirt as her. Just saying. Anyway. I know, I'm a complete kiss ass, all right? Just, just leave me alone. Anyway, today is an amazing subject. I know that I've already done my, like, what, top 10 favorite monsters throughout history or the scariest monsters throughout history or whatever that series was called. I've already forgot. I've slept since then, y'all. I actually slept. <laughs> um, and at the top of the list, by the way, if you haven't seen the list, go see the list first. I will link it up here. Spoiler alert. At the top of my list is, of course, the werewolf, the loop garou. <laughs> I absolutely love werewolves, partly because I have a very spiritual connection to wolves in general. I adore them so much, um, but partly because, I don't know, they're just badass. Like, they're fucking werewolves. Anyway. One of my social media friends, Isaac, shout out, uh, messaged me some really awesome materials about ancient uh, werewolf stories, werewolf legends, myths, whatever you want to call them. And I've been watching the videos, reading some articles, really getting to know these different legends before I did this, so I'm hoping I don't have to like utilize my notes too much. But if y'all know me at all, I have a shit memory like literally the shittiest memory known to man i don't know if maybe i was dropped on my head as a child and there's some like damage there <laughs> so let's dive into this topic about werewolves so basically what i'm going to be talking about is like what three or four different ancient legends myths and stories about the very first werewolves so the first story I'm going to be talking about, for those of you who are as already like obsessed with werewolves as I am, who already have done all the legwork into studying all this, um, we're going to be talking about the Beast of Gévaudan. And I have no idea if I'm saying I just wanted to sound like sexy French. Gévaudan. It all started in June 1764 when several shepherds from Gévaudan, or that area, that region of, I want to say France? Yeah, France. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, Michelle, talking about that shitty memory. <laughs> several shepherds witnessed a very large wolf-like creature. It had like reddish fur, but it was odd. Like it didn't look like the normal wolves from that region. It had this strange black row of fur down its spine. Well, kind of like a hyena. There were actually some theories in there that it might have been a hyena or some kind of quote-unquote foreign monster from Africa or somewhere else. Like maybe someone had brought it up and it had gotten loose and it was ravaging the countryside. But yeah, it all started when some shepherds witnessed this creature. And when they witnessed it, it was already on the rampage. So the carnage started on June 30th when a girl was said to literally have been devoured by this beast. Now I'm assuming she wasn't completely devoured, like there had to have been at least some partial remains to be identified off of. Um, but yeah, that's how it started. Lovely. Let's just eat a girl. Ugh. The next event occurred, I want to say on August 6th, when a shepherd death, which is, you know, a female shepherd, because women can do everything men can. <laughs> She was also uh, fatally wounded and practically eaten. Sam, so, yeah. I hope, I really hope that this was not some kind of like deranged person at the end of the day because they ate a lot of human flesh. And only two days after that event on August 6th, another girl was attacked and fa fatally wounded. It didn't say anything about being partially eaten, but she was at least fatally wounded somehow. And I'm kind of glad they didn't go into details because I was, I was getting tired of the whole devoured thing. Ugh, ugh. Then on August 30th, a young cow herd was fatally wounded. And the attacks just kept coming all through September. 
mostly women and children were attacked. Um, there were very few men or boys involved. It got so bad that the nobles of the land actually finally banded together, started organizing different hunts, started organizing different like groups of men to go out and try to find and kill this beast, almost in like a military-like fashion, to be honest. And they offered a reward. I want to say all together, this shit was like a 10,000 pounds reward to kill this beast. But at this time, this beast had even had already broadened its territory. It wasn't just Gévaudan. <coughs> anyway, it wasn't just Gévaudan. It was all sorts of different regions across the French countryside were being attacked and harassed by this beast, which led to a lot of questions, right? Was it just one beast? Was it several? Was there a whole pack? Were they organized in some kind of way? Was human beings involved somehow? There was a theory that maybe some lunatic was training giant dogs to actually attack and kill people. And of course, there was the theory that it could be a werewolf. On October 8th, the beast was reportedly wounded twice by hunters. Twice, I tell you, this sucker was shot and it still managed to get away. One of the odd things about this case is that a lot of the victims were found undressed like their clothes were not on them which is creepy and weird to begin with and a lot of them had their throats slashed or or were completely decapitated so all sorts of legendary wolf hunters were brought in most of them sent by nobles or, or even the king himself which i want to say was like king louis the 25th at this time like really could y'all find a different name already <laughs> um, but there were a few villagers who managed to fend off the beast and protect their loved ones and the king actually rewarded these people which was kind of nice like okay I just risked my life and almost got eaten to save my family it's kind of nice to get a monetary reward for that <laughs> anyway So things changed in June 1765, which was a full year that these people have been suffering, a full year of carnage and ravaging the countryside and eating people, um, when a Mr. Antoine was sent, I believe he was sent by the king. He was placed on the scene, he organized these hunts, but ironically there was a family, I want to say last name was Chastel, yeah, Chastel, there was a family Chastel family. Several men in that family didn't necessarily get along with Mr. Antoine's crew. They got into a fight. Mr. Antoine put several of the Chastel boys in prison until he left. But one of the creepy things about this is when they put the Chastel boys in prison, it seemed like the attacks had a marked decrease. They were still occurring, but it seemed like there was a marked decrease in how often and um, how many attacks there were at the time, which you know is why a lot of theorists believe that the Chastel family had something to do with the Beast of Gévaudan. On September 21st, Mr. Antoine shot and killed a giant wolf. They sent the wolf off, had the body stuffed, and Mr. Antoine collected that nice hefty reward. And yet, the carnage continued. Can you can y'all figure out that I like the word carnage? Maybe it's because I just saw Venom. And I'm ready. I'm ready for carnage, y'all. But at this point, with one wolf dead, it seemed like all the nobles just kind of turned their head and was like, oh, we don't care anymore. Like, <laughs> the reward's been given out. We don't care anymore. So, from 1764 all the way until 1767, this... Uh, these attacks kept occurring. They kept happening. There would be times of relative peace where it seemed like it was dying down and then boom, it would come back full force. A lot of the times in the spring. Specifically in spring of 1767 was like, that was it. The people had had enough. We were taught, I say we. <laughs> Past life memories? I don't know. Um, they had had enough. A young nobleman who was actually only 19, which is kind of cool. I would say their names, but y'all just do not want to hear me butcher some French names. It's worse than the Romania. It's worse. So it finally got to be too much. The women were being attacked and killed again. A nun had been partially eaten already. 
And this young nobleman, as I said, he was only 19 years old, took up arms and decided to organize some people. Ironically enough, some of the people he brought in for these hunts that he was organizing was some of the Chastels. But the last victim that they found was on June 17th of 1767, so practically four solid years later. But the last victim was found in June. I don't know what it is about June, but anyway, that was the last victim they found. Her throat was cut, which was weird. Like, how is someone's throat cut and not, like, ripped out? If it's a beast, wouldn't it be ripped out? Wouldn't it be clawed up, not just, like, sliced like a knife? Like, that doesn't make any sense to me, but whatever. And in an ironic twist of fate, they find the beast, they chase the beast, and Chastel, the Chastel boy, ends up killing the beast and finally putting an end to all the carnage and all the people eating, right? Ironic. Very, very ironic. All right, another ancient myth um, regarding werewolves is the myth of King Lycaon, which I want to say is Greek mythology. Yeah, yeah, because there's Zeus involved. So apparently Zeus likes to be Mr. Trickster sometimes and show up and crash people's parties in disguises. Not sure why he felt like doing that. Most of the time it was to sleep with people's wives because he couldn't keep it in his pants or anything. Anyway, he shows up at King Lycaon's house in disguise. King Lycaon is like, ha ha, you're not that great, Zeus. I see you. And basically tries to feed Zeus human flesh. Zeus figures it out real quick, freaks out, gets really pissed off, and curses King Lycaon, and I believe his sons, some versions of this story are different, to become wolves, and in other versions it says to become wolf-human hybrids, which would be what our understanding of a werewolf is. So there's that in Greek mythology. And then in Christian legend, and I say legend not because I don't believe that this ha didn't happen, but because there is an interesting parallel here. So while in Greek mythology we have King Lycaon and Zeus, in Christian mythology, we have King Nebuchadnezzar versus God. So King Nebuchadnezzar was sitting around being very prideful, boastful, you know, pride goeth before the fall and all that jazz. He has this dream. Well, Daniel can interpret dreams. He interprets King Nebuchadnezzar's dream. King Nebuchadnezzar probably didn't like it very much. And in the end, God curses him to become a beast. I don't really know if this was supposed to be a werewolf legend necessarily, or if it was just supposed to be a tale of caution. But I just find it really interesting, these two stories. We've got God and King Nebuchadnezzar turning him into a beast, most likely a wolf-like creature. And then we have Zeus turning King Lycaon into a wolf-like creature. You, do, you, do you dig what I'm laying down here? There's some kind of... There's some kind of cohesion here, happening here. Then of course we have the story of Romulus and Remus, which is in Roman mythology. Romulus and Remus were these twins. Um, supposedly they were the sons of the Roman god Mars. Um, divine children who were supposed to take up the throne. The current guy who had like killed and done all sorts of skeevy shit to get the throne ordered a servant to take the twins out and drown them in a river. The servant decides, you know what, I have a heart, I don't want to do that, sends them along the river in a basket. Tell me that doesn't sound like Moses. <laughs> anyway, a she-wolf, a female wolf, finds the basket with the boys and raises the boys. She suckles them, she takes care of them, she keeps them warm, and as the children grow, they're very animalistic. They're very wolf-like. I don't know if they're necessarily wolf-like in appearance or anything, but they're very animalistic in nature. Very beasty. <laughs> anyway, a shepherd eventually finds the twins, takes them in, and teaches them how to be human again. In all of this process, there is, of course, <laughs> the telltale Roman slash Greek 
tragedy element, which is basically the boys grow up, um, they defeat the king who tried to kill them when they were young, they decide to go out on their own and build their own kingdom, they end up quarreling about where the kingdom should be, and Romulus ends up killing Remus. <laughs> yeah. Why do brothers always have to kill each other in these freaking Roman and Greek mythologies? I don't understand it. Why do families have to keep killing each other? But anyway, so Romulus takes up the throne. Remus is dead at this point. Um, and there's really not that much divinity about the rest of that story. Eventually Romulus dies. There's no more mention about the two ever having animal-like qualities or being werewolf in nature. That's pretty much it. But I say all of these different legends and all these different stories to basically tie in a parallel. If you've noticed every single mythology, every single culture, every single anything from all over the world have ties specifically to wolves. Even in ancient Egyptian, Babylonian, African, we have the goddess Ishtar. She, there was a legend that she basically cursed one of her ex-lovers to become a wolf. Like, wolves are everywhere. And the reason being is because back in ancient times, their, what's the right word here? Their span across the world was huge. You could find wolves in Japan, in Africa. I'm not talking about hyenas. I'm talking about real wolves. You could find real wolves in Africa, in the Middle East, and of course Europe in Russia, in North and South America, everywhere. Wolves were once everywhere. That's why they are so directly tied to human mythology and all different mythologies. I can't think of many other animals that have that large of an effect on humanity and on the growth of humanity and on the legends and myths. I think that's why werewolves to this day are so predominant in like the paranormal and in storytelling and I think that's why they're still so very famous. Um, but yeah, I'm sorry that I've been sitting here ranting and raving for 20 minutes on this guys. I'm not trying to sound insane or crazy. I just absolutely love wolves and of course that means I love werewolves. So what do you guys think? Do y'all have any other ancient stories to tell about possible werewolves? Do you have any modern stories to tell? Let me know. Let us know. Comment down below. And if you liked today's video, be sure to give it a thumbs up. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. And please share this video with anyone who is as crazy and insane about werewolves as I am. And with that being said, guys, I love y'all so much. I hope y'all are having a great day. I hope you are enjoying this 31 days of Halloween with me. And that's it, guys. 